I don't hardly struggle with allergies at all, so I love springtime. I had no idea that people didn't like springtime until I started hanging around with people who have allergies, like my entire family. Uh, they, they all have it. Uh, so good to be here. Let's, let's start out with a prayer. Dear God, we thank you uh, for this moment, for this day, and we just uh, uh, pray that as we, we open up your word this morning, that you uh, speak to our hearts, you speak to our lives, uh, that you uh, move in us in a way that, is, that shapes us, that, uh, that actually makes, begins making a, a change in our lives for the better. Uh, God, I just, your word is so powerful, and you, you are so good to us, and that you communicate to us in so many ways. And I just pray that this might be one way this morning that you uh, reach us. Uh, I, I know that it's so, uh, so easy for us to go through life and, and to just not hear you, not hear your voice, not uh, recognize what you're trying to say to us because we're just, we're too busy, we're too distracted, whatever it is, and, and I pray that, that you might uh, pierce through all the fog that our lives can be sometimes and, uh, and, and use this time for good, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Ben, uh, my, my oldest child, he, uh, he's, this is his first year on a baseball team that's actually serious about winning, okay? And what I, what I mean is, like, for the last couple of years, he was, like, you know, t-ball, and basically they learned to catch a grounder and try to throw it to first base, and they tried to hit, you know, hit the ball. And that was pretty much it. That, that, that was all they that was concerned about. And now, all of a sudden, he arrives on this team, and they're throwing it all over the place. I mean, these guys know about double plays and how to do other stuff. And, of course, he's completely lost because, you know, I, I mean, he doesn't like to practice, and so I don't really push him on that kind of stuff very much. So he's completely lost. And, and, uh, but it's, it's been, a, been an interesting experience. And so be like, okay, Ben, this is what you do, you know, trying to get him to, you know, understand how the game works a little bit. Well, Thursday they had a practice game. And, uh, and, and you know, he, he did well. He, he hit the ball a couple of times and, you know, filled the ball. He did, did a good job. And, and you know, there are, you know, parents and stuff in the stands that are really encouraging, especially for those kids that maybe aren't the absolute most athletically gifted, which is probably includes everybody in my family. And, uh, and, and so, you know, oh, Ben, that's a great job. And afterwards, you know, I'm giving them high fives. You know, great job. You know, good job. You did this. You're really good. You know, and getting encouragement and, you know, tell them, hey, you know, remind, remember this kind of stuff. And, and I, we were driving home, and I, and I thought, you know, I, I don't know if I have given him any more positive affirmation for one single little event in the last several weeks, maybe several months, that I did for him hitting a baseball a couple of times just now. I mean, you know, it's, I mean, it's not like I don't, you know, praise them, you know, our kids for stuff. I mean, when Ben and Hope bring home their school stuff, you know, their teachers, and, you know, I'll look at their schoolwork, and they do usually do a really good job, and I'll, you know, I'll tell them, I'll, you know, compliment them and everything. But it's not like with the excitement that somehow comes out of me when he manages to hit a baseball with a bat. You know, I, I don't know why they just, you know, just, and, and so I, and it's kind of weird because you think, well, their performance in school is probably, I mean, generally speaking, most likely going to have a bigger impact on their whole life than their performance on the baseball field. And, you know, so, but, you know, their performance on the baseball field has more immediate gratification. I mean, nobody is at their school. I mean, their teachers are encouraging all that stuff. But typically speaking, they don't have people just cheering them on every time they do a good job on a worksheet at school. You know, they, they don't have this, you know, instant gratification, positive affirmation for everything good they do in school, much less for things like character. I mean, for, for being kind to somebody, for, for putting someone's needs above your own, for being honest when it's hard, for making godly decisions. I mean, so many times those things don't come with a lot of instant gratification. There's not, not a whole lot of people cheering on every time some kind of great moment is made like that, where you choose God's way instead of your own way. And I just oddly enough, that seems to be the way it really is often in life. Often, the less impo lesser important things have more instant gratification. And those things that are of greater value, many times, don't have a lot of instant gratification. They require this long-term, persistent, 
working through something with, without a lot of instant gratification until perhaps much later. Uh, even relationships are like this. Um, marriage, for instance. Now, I'm not being crude here, okay? But having sex is generally easy and instant gratification, okay? Having a good, loving relationship in marriage is often takes a lot of patience, a lot of hard work over a long period of time, a lot of commitment, and for often for periods of time, there is not a lot of instant gratification at all. But then at the end of that, what you have is something of just immeasurable value. Because see, those things that are more important often do not have that instant gratification with them. It takes a longer haul, persistent, long-term kind of commitment thing. Uh, jobs, your, your, your career is the same way. Um, it's not necessarily the most talented person that uh, is successful but it's those people who are focused over the long term on a goal, and they stick with it, and they keep at it, and they keep at it, and over that long term, good things happen. It's just the way that this world is created, the way that God made it, maybe because it's just God's way, that those things that are of utmost importance take a longer term commitment, and often that gratification for it is delayed on down the road. We've been, we've been looking at the book of Philippians, and in chapter 3, we, we began to look at last week, and uh, Paul was telling, telling us what was important to him. He said this was important, of ultimate importance to him, and, and this thing that was of such importance was worth him, it was worth him giving up his high position in society, his career as he knew it, it was worth him giving up his money, his relationships, uh, really basically all of his life as he knew it. He said, this thing was worth me giving it up, giving up all of it. What was this thing that was so important to him? It was knowing Jesus. Knowing Jesus was worth giving up everything in his life for him to have that. and He wanted that more than anything. Uh, here's what he said that we looked at last week. He says, well, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Paul had come to know. He'd come to know Jesus. He was coming to know Jesus in a greater way. And his knowledge of Jesus was causing him, just igniting a hunger with him, where he wanted to know Jesus more and more. He wanted more of Jesus. He wanted to experience Jesus' power. He wanted to experience, oddly to us, Jesus' sufferings. Whatever, whatever was involved in knowing Jesus, he wanted it, whether it was tough or whether it was easy, whether it was gratifying or whether it was really difficult for a time. And it wasn't just some personal, spiritual thing, okay? It wasn't just about Paul, you know, praying to God and, 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 and reading God's word, which certainly that was involved in it, but it wasn't just about just him and God. For, for Paul, knowing Christ, knowing Jesus, also involved joining Jesus in what Jesus is doing in this world. It involved serving people. It involved loving people. For him, especially, it was about teaching people about Jesus. He wanted to help other people know Jesus. For Paul, part of knowing Jesus was helping other people know him as well. And he would do whatever it took to make Jesus known. To know Jesus means to become more like Jesus in the way that we think and in what we do. It means to care about the things that Jesus, is, that Jesus cares about and do the things that Jesus is doing. Okay, going back to back to Paul's letter. In chapter 3, Paul has been kind of being autobiographical, okay? Because he's been talking about himself and about what is important to him, what matters to him, and what, what that leads him to do. But he wants it to be known that he doesn't think that he's got it all figured out, that he has it all together, that he's, hey, I've arrived at this place that's perfect, and now I can tell you all what to do. He wants us to know that he's on this journey too, that he's, a, he's just on the journey, he's getting there, and he's not there yet. And this is what he says. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that 
for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Knowing Jesus for Paul is both a present reality and a future goal. Paul has come to know Jesus. He is growing in his knowledge of Jesus, and he is looking forward to the day when he knows Jesus face to face, where there is no barrier between him, when he is completely with the one who created him, who loved him, who has saved him, who has rescued him. He is looking forward to that moment. We see that Paul's focus on the future fuels him. It gives him life. It gives him purpose. Um, you know, as Paul writes this letter, we, we've said often, Paul's sitting in a jail cell, okay? He is in jail. He's in prison when he's writing this letter. So he's not in the most hopeful of circumstances, but his joy and his excitement is so great that even as he slogs through the hours of being in jail, his hope and his purpose uh, is, is there and is growing uh, even at that moment. Let's look, let's look more in detail, okay, at what Paul has to say. He says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I love this phrase. Now, this takes a little bit of mental gymnastics, okay, to sort this last phrase out. But this whole deal of, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. He's saying, Jesus has taken hold of me. He has captured me. He has taken me in, and he has taken hold of me for a purpose, for a reason. And that reason is what fuels me in life. That reason is what I live for. It's the most important thing in my life. What is, what is that reason? What, what, what is it? Why did Jesus take hold of Paul? Why has Jesus taken hold of me? Why has Jesus possibly taken hold of you? Why was Paul, what was Paul pursuing after? Well, he's just told us, knowing Jesus. The reason that God has, that Jesus has taken hold of us, the reason that, that Jesus had taken hold of Paul is so that Paul might know him, that Paul might be in a real personal relationship with him. The reason he has taken hold of you, if you've allowed him to take hold of you, is so that you might, might know him. And Paul says, and that's the very reason, that's, that's what fuels me in life, that's what is most important in my life, is that I might know Jesus. The goal is not heaven, per se, okay? Hear me on this. The goal is not heaven. The goal is Jesus. The goal is God. There is no greater motivator for a follower of Jesus than to be with God the Father and with his son Jesus. Now, I realize when I say that, that surely, surely some of us have tough time taking hold of that. Because it's like, okay, so you're saying the great goal of life, I mean the most important thing in all of life, the great thing that I have to look forward to in the future is to, to know Jesus. Maybe that doesn't sound like such a prize to you, okay? Maybe, that, maybe it's like, that just does, sounds pretty anticlimactic. That just doesn't sound so great to me. And, and, I, and I can get that because if, if you don't know Jesus, you, you don't realize what an awesome, wonderful thing that is. The, the more you get to know Jesus, the more you look forward to the day when you are totally with him in all of his glory, experiencing Jesus, experiencing God the Father face to face, held by him, experiencing life with him, that, that will absolutely light you on fire if you've come to know Jesus. And, and if you haven't, you really can't get why that is such a big deal. Um, truthfully, you may have been a religious person, you may have come to church for years, for decades, and yet not know Jesus. You might be sitting here, look, I, I've come to church all my life. I grew up in a Christian family. I've done the church thing for forever. And, you know, to me, the thought of knowing Jesus 
just does, that doesn't sound like the greatest thing in the entire world that I just want to sacrifice my whole life to. I'm going to tell you, it is so very easy to be religious for long periods of time, for your whole life. So easy to be religious and never to know Jesus, never to actually have a genuine, personal, growing relationship with Jesus. Uh, so many people become Christians because they don't want to go to hell. They want to go to heaven. You relate with that? How many people become Christians? Why? Why don't you become to become a Christian? Oh, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven instead. You know, when I die, I want to go to heaven. That's a good place. Not go to hell when I'm a bad place. That's it. And the thing is, we can miss the very reason for becoming a Christian. The reason for becoming a Christian is not so you will go to heaven instead of going to hell. The reason you were created, the reason you were made, the reason to come to faith in Jesus is because you want to know Him. Because having a relationship with Him is the biggest deal. It's the most important thing in life. It's the very reason that you and I were created. So we can easily miss out on the whole reason that we were made. There's a world of difference. We talked about this last week. There's a world of difference between knowing Jesus and being religious. Paul says, I press on toward the goal of knowing the one who saved me, of knowing my Lord. He restates and elaborates on that this way. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. He's looking forward to that day to be with Jesus. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining forward uh, toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. In Christ Jesus. Okay, Paul starts, he, he uses analogy here. He uses a race analogy. Imagines himself as a runner in a race. And a runner in a race has to forget about the stuff that's behind him or her. Okay? If a race, if a, if a runner stumbles out of the starting blocks, they have, to, they have to ignore that and race, okay? They can't allow the fact that they just stumbled in the, stunning, stum, in, the, in the blocks to just destroy their race. They've got to go on. They can't worry about the runners who are running behind them. They've got to focus forward, focus on toward that goal. What we see is that Paul, in imagining himself as a runner in, in a race, what we notice is that he has a forward focus that on here, a forward focus. One of the things that can keep us from having an, a real relationship with Jesus, from knowing Jesus, is a focus on the past. Okay? A focus on the past can destroy our relationship with Jesus. Uh, many of us maybe have sins in our past that just are weights around our neck as we seek to know Jesus. These, these things that, have, that we have done in the past, these patterns of behavior that we have had, they just they destroy our life of faith. I mean, we want. I mean, you may be someone, you, you want to be a godly person. You want to just pursue God with joy. You want to make a difference in this world. You want to be with God. But, but, man, for me to really launch out and, and tell people about Jesus, to really serve people, to really make a difference... After all the stuff I've done, I'd be a hypocrite. I mean, people know what I've done. People, people know what my life has been like. And for me to start living as like I'm you know, all about Jesus, I mean, it's just, I'd just be a hypocrite. Paul knows exactly how you feel. Because Paul persecuted Christians. Paul put Christians in jail. Paul approved of their death. Paul was basically a state-sponsored terrorist. He terrorized Christians. He tried to stamp out the faith by terrorizing them. He, he knew what it was like to, uh, to have stuff in his past that wanted to drag him uh, away from God, drag, keep him from following, following Jesus. If you still carry around the guilt of things you've done in the past, I'm not up here to tell you that it's okay. I'm not going to tell you, oh, you know, don't worry about the stuff you've done in the past. It's okay. It's really not that big a deal. It's really not that important. Hey, sin's a big deal. Sin's important. And there's just not, it's, not that, it's not that it wasn't wrong. It was wrong. It was against God. It was, a, it was a terrible thing, whatever it was. But what does God want you to do now? What does God want you to do from here? 
He wants you to confess it. To con confess it to God, but also to confess it to those maybe who you've hurt, who you have damaged through what you have done. Confess it to others. He wants you to repent of it, to be truly sorry for what you have done, and to turn away from that, to turn away from that sin and start pursuing God. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect from now on. That means you turn toward God and you start, start seeking God to repent. God wants you to learn from, from the mistakes in the past. He wants you to learn from the sins that you've had in the past. Don't, don't let that go to waste. Learn the lessons from what you have done in the past and your repentance of that. But then, forget about it. Forget it. Leave it behind and go. You cannot live your life being defined by the things that you have done wrong in the past. It will destroy you. And that's the way for all of us. God wants you to believe him, to trust him when he tells you that you're forgiven. I guarantee you, God is not sitting around fretting over all the things that you've done in the past. Okay? God wants you to own his forgiveness and to let it go and to move on. For some of us, um, old patterns of thinking and living have a way of, of dragging us down. Uh, many of us were, were raised with certain, we were taught certain things by, by, by families, maybe by our, our churches growing up, that have really been debilitating toward us. A lot of us, we learned how to be religious. We did not learn how to know Jesus. We learned how to do religious things. We did not know how to have a real relationship, a real growing relationship with Jesus. And, and you may have, have grown up in a, in a church environment, a family environment, where you, we were really taught patterns of thinking and behavior that really mess up, mess with your ability to be a follower of Jesus. And so if that's you, recognize it. Leave it behind. You can't help the fact of what you were taught when you were growing up. But you have every bit of responsibility for what you do from here on out. Don't let the, the ways that you were taught, the things that you, patterns of behavior that you learned growing up to define who you're going to be from here on. Leave that past behind. Some of us may even, uh, our problem may be that we live in the past, our past successes, okay? Maybe you have a very successful uh, spiritual past. Um, Maybe you, have a, you used to be really involved in serving Jesus. Boy, you used to be passionate about your relationship with Jesus. Uh, you used to serve God in really, really deep and significant ways. You did some impressive things a while back. And that's all great and everything. It's all good. But have those things that you were doing in the past, have those led to you, led you to have a growing relationship with Jesus now? Has it led you to deeper and more significant ways of serving God, ways of serving Christ now? Do you kind of lean back on, oh yeah, I've done some good things in the past, I've thought some good things in the past. What about now? What are you doing now? How are you thinking now? Really, more, more importantly, what direction are you going? Are you going toward Jesus? Are you going, getting closer to him? Are you learning more and, and actually able to live out your faith more? Is that growing in you? Or are you drifting away from him? Are you dwelling on the past? Or are you striving toward the future? Paul says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Paul didn't dread the future. Paul didn't pine about the good old days. Paul, Paul didn't you know, worry about, oh, what, what a terrible thing that this, this world is coming to. Uh, he didn't lament getting older. Paul was straining toward the future. What Paul was excited about lay in the future. What Paul was, was wanting, what his destination was in the future. He was looking toward the future. He wasn't fearful of the future. He wanted the future. The closer he got that way, the closer he got to where he was wanting to go. You know, in our culture, we really, we fear the future. We, if somebody invented a product 
that stopped the aging process at age 29. The person who invented that product would be the richest person in the world by the end of the week. I mean, you know that, right? I mean, we, we want to stay young. We don't want to get older. We, we, don't want the, we, we don't like change. We don't like death. That's our culture. But for the follower of Jesus, the person who knows and trusts Jesus, getting older means that you're just getting that much closer to the life that you have always wanted. For everything that you are longing for, you're getting closer to that. The more you know Jesus, the more you look forward to fully being with him. So to know Jesus is to have a forward focus, okay? To look ahead, to anticipate and be excited about and long for that which God has in store for you. Not just off in the distance, but this journey that he's taking you on. It's a forward focus. Second of all, we find that Paul has this persistent pursuit. This persistent pursuit. Uh, let's, let's read this once more. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. In Christ Jesus. Paul says it in verse 12. He says it again here in verse 14. I press on toward the goal. Paul's life was not great because of some great spiritual experience that he had. Now, Paul had some great spiritual experiences, but his life was not great because of those. Paul's life was not great because he accomplished some big Thing, some one certain thing that Paul, you can pin that, wow, Paul did, did that, and that's what makes his life great. Paul's life wasn't great because he was just at the right place at the right time and did the right thing, and this incredible thing happened. Paul's life was great because he kept on pursuing his goal of knowing Jesus, of serving Jesus, of loving Jesus, of serving people, and loving people. See, for Paul, knowing Jesus, so much about joining Jesus and what Jesus was doing on the, on the earth, for Paul, what it meant was for him to tell as many people about Jesus as much, whenever, wherever he could. That's what he set his life to doing. I want to tell as many people about Jesus that I can wherever I am, whenever I can. And he did that day after day after day. He did that when it led to his being stoned. He did that when it led to people thinking he was a god. He did that when it led to people praising him and thinking he was great and, and, and following what he was saying and listening to him. He did that when it led to him being flogged. He did it when it led to him being kicked out of town, when it led to him being in prison, and he kept on doing it when he was in prison. He just kept on doing what his goal was to do. He wanted to know Jesus, and he wanted to make Jesus known, and he just kept on doing that. Through the super high times, through the super low times, he kept at it. Paul knew something that is just, it's just a principle about, about pursuing a good goal. And this is it. Continual gets you there. Occasional does not. For Paul, continually seeking Jesus, continually pursuing a relationship with Jesus, continually serving him, that was what would get him to where he was going, not something that he just did occasionally. For example, um, let's just suppose that I wanted to really, really, really get in shape, okay? And so I decided one day, okay, I'm going to run six miles today. Now, a lot of you have run a lot more than that. I don't think I have ever run six miles at one time in my entire life, okay? So I just say, okay, I'm going to run six miles today. And so that day, I, I went, I ran, and I ran, and I just about killed myself. But I, I ran. I got six miles, and I ran that six miles, and I was done, and I felt really good about it. And about a month later, I did it again. And about a month, six weeks later, I, I did that again. And I kept up that pattern for a couple of years. Now, at the end of that couple of years, how much healthier am I? 
Zero. I'm not one bit healthier doing that. It's because it's not in the occasional. Anything, any valuable goal, anything that is worth value is not something you just do occasionally. It is something that, that you have to pursue in an ongoing way, in a continual way, because it's doing that same thing, doing it continually, that makes a difference. Some of you right now, maybe partly because of what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, you sense a need in your life to have time where you just focus on God, where you just focus on Jesus, on your relationship with Him, where you get with Him and you talk to Him and you listen for Him. Maybe you read, read it, some of his word and you think about it and you let God speak to you where you just take some time where it's just you and God. Build on that relationship. And, and you may have, have realized that that's something that needs to happen in your life for years. I mean, you may have been saying for years, yes, I really need to pray and read my Bible. I really need to, really need to do that. But and sometimes you would get really motivated, really inspired, and you would do it like for a few days, you know, and, and then, you know, it just kind of get busy and kind of, you know, kind of fall off and, and, and maybe try it again sometime six months down the road, and, and it really doesn't, doesn't get you anywhere, does it? I mean, it's, it's the continual. It's that persistence. It's that persistent pursuing of that relationship where change actually happens. And it's not about doing a checklist. Oh, I hate, I hate it when, when we speak in terms of I need to read my Bible and pray every day. Like, like it's a good deed that I do that day. No, it's about knowing Jesus. It's, about, it's always about knowing Jesus. It's not about some kind of checklist. It's not about being good enough. It's not about being spiritual enough. It's about coming to know Jesus. Maybe that's something that you've been sensing in your life needs to happen. Will you just commit to that and do it continually? Build that relationship with, with you and Christ. Maybe for you, You've been sensing a need in your life to, to really be the hands and feet of Jesus, to, to start serving people, to really, you know, to, to try to serve people in a way that makes a difference in their life where in some way you can share your faith with people and you can really help people out. Now, what is the best way to become that, that kind of servant kind of person? Is it to, to do a really big service project once every six months? Probably not. Probably not. To, to hold a really big, cool event once every, every six months, two or three times a year, probably not. What really makes a difference in your life and in the lives of, of those you want to serve is when you begin to serve a group of people in, on a continual basis. When you build relationships with people, you get to know them and you get to serve them and you do that in a continual, ongoing way. That's when change happens in their lives and, and in yours. It is, it is what is continual, not what is occasional, that ends up making a difference. When it comes to pursuing Jesus, when it comes to knowing and serving him, we must be persistent. And Paul serves as a model for us in this, that, that he focuses focuses on the future. He has this future focus of leaving the past behind, leaving distractions behind, not getting distracted by all the stuff around him, focusing in on his goal and going toward that goal of knowing Jesus and everything that that means. And then of persistently pursuing that relationship with Jesus, doing it, doing it on a continual basis. It's not about being religious. Remember, remember, it's not about being good enough, checking some checklists in a box. Okay, I've done this, 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 and this, and so I'm okay. It's about knowing Jesus and doing whatever is necessary to know him. If we keep that focus and that, be that persistent, we'll find our lives becoming what God created them to be. Would you pray with me?